Hey guys, welcome to the video. My name's Kyle. I'm a third year architecture student from South Australia and you're watching Successful Archie Student, which is a community to help architecture students succeed and connect with each other. If you want to get to know a bit more about us, you can check the links in the description of this video. So in today's video, I want to talk about why and how to develop a concept in architecture. So this video is going to be a concept design strategy guide for architecture students. So we may as well get straight into it. So first things first, when coming up with a concept design, um, whether this be for a, a client or your teachers in architecture school, the first thing to do is to read and understand the brief. Um, read it a hundred times if you must. And I always say that once you've understood it or you begin to understand it, read it again. So that's the first thing to understand the brief. Understand the brief that is so important and so once you've read the brief a hundred times and you actually understand it then you can start to highlight the important information or write it write it out or um, break it down so that you actually understand what the client or your teacher wants and so it's it's extremely important that you understand the brief before you move on to the next step understand the brief i can't i can't say that enough so once you do understand the brief then you can move on to making a list make a list so first of all you can list the key features so a key features this might be something like oops key features make a list and list the key features so this might be something like it's well lit you know what you're getting this from the brief so this is why it's important to understand the brief because the brief will tell you the key features and it might say that they want a well lit uh, house or building and it's got to be modern modern and maybe they want it to be quiet and also two stories this is what you'd get from the brief two stories so the key features is that it's well lit, modern, quiet, and has two stories. So you then want to make a list of the rooms or spaces that it says in the in the brief. So this, uh, well, I'll write this down. Um, so list the rooms, list the rooms or spaces provided in the brief. So this might be things like you know they want a gym room, gym room. They want a uh, or two bedrooms. Bed. Ah, oh. they might want an office, and also maybe a games room. We'll say. So we'll just finish out there. Games room. So then you also want to make a list of the constraints. So you've got key features, the list of the rooms and spaces that's provided in the brief, and the constraints, things to avoid. So I'll put here constraints, and this will vary from project to project. So now that you've understood the brief, you've read it as many times as it takes for you to completely understand it, which is the most important thing, um, and you've made a list of the key features, um, the, the list of the rooms and spaces, and also a list of the constraints, or the things to avoid. So next what you can do is start creating diagrams showing the amount of space required or asked of in the brief. So quite often we have a um, space requirement or limitation uh, set out in the brief. You know, rooms can only be so big or so small. And so what you can do is then create a diagram of this um, to really help us understand kind of how, how big the, the rooms and spaces are that we're working with. Even if it's just a rough um, diagram, it doesn't matter because we're just trying to understand um, kind of the difference between each, each, each of the spaces and how they connect and work together. So what this diagram may look like is that, um, so we've got the, the list of the rooms, which we've got the gym room, the two bedrooms, and also the office and games room. In the brief, it might say that the gym room has to be 60 meters squared and the two bedrooms might be 40 meters each 40 meters squared each and maybe the office and the games room are 100 meters squared each these are just random numbers i'm pulling off the top of my head but then what you would do is with those numbers from the brief is you would create a diagram of that so now what you do is draw other bubbles around this um, gym room uh, showcasing kind of the difference between the sizes of the, of the spaces in the rooms. So for example, the two bedrooms are 40 meters squared each. What you would do is draw a 40, med uh, 40 meter squared circle next to the gym room, which uh, showcases that, so, and you just write bed in there. And see how it's only rough, you know, this is approximately 60 meters squared, where this one's approximately 40 meters squared. 
as, uh, as a comparison of each other. So that can be bedroom one, and then bedroom two might be, say, over here. That's 40 meters squared. Bedroom two. You might then have an office space, which it says is 100 meters squared. So then you can draw that in here. That's roughly 100 meters squared. And you'd write office. And so in the key features here, it says they want a two-story place. And so maybe the games room is on the top story and so you would draw that in the next diagram but to get an understanding of how big the games room is we can say put it in here and it will be roughly about the same as this one here games room and so now we understand the relationship of size of the rooms that are required and we can s compare them to each other and sit start to kind of move them around and understand what they look like. What is also extremely important is that you understand and think about the site. If you're doing a school project um, in architecture school where there's no site that's been allocated, um, it's, it's great to make one up and this shows that you're thinking outside of the box and you're really considering the different conditions that would happen in the real world. And by simulating a site, it really shows that you're um, thinking deeply about the project and considering all of its different aspects. And really the site is a big part of the design. Um, I'd say it probably allocates to more than 40% of the actual design because you're not going to design this small little building next to a skyscraper. Um, if you've got a row of houses that are all looking the same, your design is going to look out of place if you um, don't know what those existing site conditions are. You know, the way it's orientated on the site um, and, and with neighbouring buildings. If you've got this tiny little building and you're looking for your design to be well lit but there's a really big building blocking out a proportion of your site, um, that's going to be an issue and so if you don't understand how the site works and you're not going to be able to get this key feature of being well lit. You know, you might not be able to get this key feature of it being quiet if the site is in an urban context. There might be council regulations saying that you can't have a two-story building or it has to be three stories or, or something like this which um, constrains you from having these key features. And what's important is that you just understand um, how the site works and how this influences how your design will carry on. So it's just really important to analyse the site and understand where north is and um, how your building will be orientated on the site. If you are designing an extension, um, understand whether it's going to complement it or detract from what's already there. So once you've understood the brief and you've made a list of the key features, um, the list of the rooms and spaces and the constraints, and you've now diagrammed how the different spaces are going to be interacting with each other um, and how big they are in comparison to each other. You can start to think about the key theme which is going to help influence every design decision you have um, from that point onwards. And so the key theme I guess is the concept and I guess so far we've just talked about planning um, to come up with the concept and the key theme is the concept I would say. And so the way that you would come up with this key theme is to understand kind of the key words that the client has asked in the brief and this is where it comes back to really understanding the brief. So maybe the client's had a really hard life, you know, they've struggled, they've struggled a lot um, to get um, financially covered to build their own house. Maybe maybe that's it and so they like the idea of, a, of the theme of struggling. You know, let's say I'm designing a house myself, I've got a tattoo which says chaser of waves, maybe they like waves and um, you know, it's a tr it's in a triangle, so maybe there could be a little um, window which is a triangle which has, um, you know, the waves out with an ocean look. It just really comes back to understanding the brief and what the client actually wants or what your teachers actually want from your assessment. You have to consider who they are and what they do every single day or what they like to eat or um, the way they use their current home or kind of their profession, the way they live their lives every day. And you might have to come back to this um, quite often and re revise it and keep reconsidering it, um, which may require a lot of time, um, which is why it's really important to start early, especially just with the concept design. When you're just trying to sit down and consciously nut out a concept, it can be quite difficult. You might be struggling to get ideas, but that's why it's important to do this and then come back to it over time. And you know, as you move away from your desk, and you go for a walk in nature, you might have something that clicks and um, that can be your concept for your design. But really trying to just sit down and nut it out, it's, it's quite difficult and you'll be stressing yourself out trying to do that. And this is what Cal Newport talks about in his book Deep Work, um, how good ideas come over time and from doing stuff, um, from walking and taking uh, thinking breaks and going for jogs and, or drives around town. You really have to revise it over time. The best ideas are from um, current ideas being revised over time. 
They're not just nutted out over a single day. And so once you've got this idea for a design, say it, it might be this wave idea, where you've got this little wave structure. From that point onwards, um, every time you're considering a design element, um, you know, what door sh handles should you have, or uh, what does the b uh, bathroom counter look like, or um, anything like that. You, you know, you might design the door handle to curl up like a wave if you've got a door here. You might have the little door handle to curl up like a wave like that as well. I'm not too sure how well you can see that, but you know, all, all, all your bathroom counters might be um, in the shape of a surfboard or something like that. You know, this doesn't mean that everything should look like a wave. It, it simply means that everything should be derived from the one overarching theme of surfing, if that's your, if that's your key theme. And this is really important because that way, whenever you're stuck trying to think of a certain design element or aspect of your building, um, it doesn't take you 10 years to come up with an idea for it because everything is linked and the building is fluent with a throng, is fluent with a strong theme. And a lot of my teachers were saying to me that the design concept is only you know five percent of the project it shouldn't take or consume a lot of your time especially once you've got um, experience thinking of them and creating them you know once you're working in the practices or in when, in your later years of university but this doesn't mean that you shouldn't spend much time on it it simply means that you should um, consistently come back to it and revise it and rethink it and restructure it over time but that's also important to remember as well that the further into a design you get the more impact changes will have on the outcome of cost and labor and time etc and so that's actually a quote from napoleon hill in think and grow rich one of my favorite books but um, it says effective people make changes slowly if at all um, whereas ineffective people make changes quickly and often and that's so important with design because coming up with a consistent concept strategy um, which has a fluent design and everything works together and inter intertwines together. That only comes from um, making your changes slowly or if at all. If you're making changes to your design um, every single day you come to work on your project and you're scrapping it and starting on something again, um, you're really going to be wasting a lot of time and you're not going to be very effective at um, producing work. So that's pretty much the end of my video of how to come up and why it's important to come up with a concept design. Um, so I think the key thing here is to understand the brief. Really go through it a hundred times if you must, but understand it completely because then you can start to make a list of that and you can start to list the key features. And seriously, write these down. Make, make a list of key features and then list the rooms and the spaces that you want. And it also lists the constraints, the things to avoid. You know, they might want to, well, you might want to avoid having a modern um, look because all the houses next to it are in a, a historic looking style or you might want to avoid it being two stories because all the surrounding buildings are skyscrapers and that's going to look extremely out of place and so once you've understood the brief made a list of it all um, then you can start to diagram out um, how the rooms intertwine and what um, they are in relationship to each other and how they look in, in terms of space and size and don't forget to consider the site the site is going to um, really account for 40% or more of your actual design because the way it's orientated and the way um, the neighboring buildings and the actual site works is um, going to have a big impact on the way you make your design decisions. And so once you've considered all of those things, you need to come up with a key theme and you can base this off of um, one of the personalities of the client or um, the personalities of the site or something that just stands out from the brief. You know, if, if they're a, a surfer or a um, astrologist and so from there when you've got a key theme you can use that key theme to um, choose all your different design elements and it will really help drive the rest of your project and so guys I really hope you found that video helpful if you did please consider subscribing and um, if you want to support what I do just like the video it really helps YouTube share this video to um, other architecture students and it really helps um, build a community of successful Archie students. You can check out one of the cool other videos I've got to the side here. And until next time, guys, take care.